What's going on everybody? This is Spiritually Biased and I'm back again with another video. Today's video will be the fourth installment of Christianity Never Came From Kemet. And today we're going to analyze the different cultures between ancient Kemet and those individuals of the Bible, both Christians and Israelites. So before we get, get started, um, I just want to ask everyone if you been looking at some of this content and you like it, please leave a like, uh, comment, just anything that will help the content go further in which these things will do. It's been a little struggle trying to be consistent with putting content out, but I'm trying, you know, just, just been very busy, got a lot of stuff going on, but without further ado, let's get into it. A great reference on this topic is the book Private Life in New Kingdom Egypt by Lynn Maskell. This book, my one criticism is she's real heavy on the feminist bent, uh, and it, it comes to the fore in, in her writing in several places. I, I kind of disagree with some of her ways of looking at that, but she directly addresses homosexuality and uh, has some very, very interesting things to say about it in here. She makes some very good points, such as, number one, our idea of gay as an identity as a lifestyle is only about a hundred to maybe a hundred and fifty years old. Um, gay as we know it didn't exist in the ancient world because they did not see uh, having same-sex desires or same-sex acts as making you a different kind of person. You could be just a dude, just a gal, but you know if you happen to uh, have relations with a member of the same sex that didn't make you a different you know sort of person. And I'm going to add this observ observation. Uh, a lot of the social cues that we have that we think, oh, this means that someone is gay, uh, didn't mean the same thing back then. For example, whether, whether it's actually true or not, we tend to perceive men who are very concerned about their physical appearance as being gay. And uh, lesbian women uh, like masculine things. But in ancient Egypt, both sexes wore jewelry, both sexes wore makeup. In fact, guys, you know, may have even been a little more prissy about their appearance than the women. And uh, you had goddesses like Neet and Sekhmet who uh, were described in hymns as a woman who acts as a man, but there were also mother goddesses. So uh, these social aspects that we consider to be markers of gay or not gay, um, those didn't mean the same thing back then. Now, did the ancient Egyptians count a third gender. You know what? Maybe. There is a particular word, and we find it in the execration texts. Those were uh, texts from the Old and Middle Kingdom that were used to cast out, you know, enemies. And uh, the word that's used is Sekheti. And it's been translated differently by different scholars. The passage, you can read it in various books. It'll say all men, all women, and then all Depending on who the scholar is, you might see all eunuchs, all intersexed, all, you know, uh, effeminate men. Uh, it really depends on who's trying to translate the word, because we don't have it in enough context to really understand it. What we really need is to find more texts that use that word, maybe in a different context, so we can understand it better. So the jury's still out on whether or not there's a third gender. There might have been a transgender in ancient Egypt. Uh, what I think is interesting to note is that uh, creator deities often are very uh, androgynous. And uh, Akhenaten in particular uh, kind of explored that in some of the art that he had commissioned. So, uh, you know, there's nothing to say that there was not uh, a third gender in ancient Egypt. As for the deed itself, the, the actual act, um, the Egyptians had a word, Nick. Uh, and it was written with a determinative that you'd get in trouble if you drew it in school. But uh, it meant penetration. And there was no negative connotation to that word. It, just, it was just there. But niku was a derogatory word for doing that to somebody. Um, and a nekek was a man who had that done to him. And that was kind of, you, you didn't want to be someone's nekek. Uh, and evidently the Egyptians in that regard felt that it was better to give than to receive. But did the ancient Egyptians have same-sex relations? Well, of course they did. You know, they were human. Um, and in fact, there is a Middle Kingdom story describing none other than King Neferkara going to the house of his unmarried general Sassanet. And uh, the story says, uh, after his majesty did what he desired with him, he returned to his place. 
now? What do you think they were doing late at night? So I want to piggyback off of what the lady was talking about in this video. So I would like to start with this scripture from Leviticus chapter 18. I'm going to start at verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, I am the Lord your God. After the doings of the land of Egypt, because that's very important, right? Wherein ye dwelt shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. So it's clearly stating here that God wanted to take Israel and make them a separate people. And in doing so, they were not to obey the customs of Egypt. So it's impossible to sit and say that the people of Israel, or the Bible rather, stole from Kemet. But let's move on. This is an article concerning men in Egypt of how they wore makeup. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. So I definitely don't want to bore you. I just want to get in and get out. So we're going to read certain snippets of the article. <clears throat> Consider ancient Egypt which is revered as the first, if not the first, civilized society in the ancient world. We have come to know about the ancient Egyptians that they allowed men to wear makeup for the purpose of beautification among others. So in today's time, that will be called effeminate. Now, there's other scriptures in the Bible talking about, you know, being effeminate and whatnot, but I'm going to forsake that for right now. It is important to pinpoint the purpose of beautification because as things stand, we have come to see the intentional and elaborate process of beautifying oneself as a feminine quality. Apparently for the ancient Egyptians, there was no, there was certainly no problem if men were also committed to painting their faces, keyword, painting their faces and thickening their eyebrows so as to be found attractive. All right. So putting makeup on as we know it today is feminine. That's something that we know women to do and not men. And men of Israel definitely didn't, um, they definitely didn't paint their faces. On top of that, Egyptian men, they were also known to be clean shaven as well. But we're going to get into that just a, a tea bit later. All right, so this is Second Kings. I'm going to start at verse um, 30. Make sure I get the chapter right. Second Kings 9.30. All right, so... And when Jehu was come to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it, and she painted her face and tired her head and looked out at a window. Now, I don't need to read any further. So basically what Jezebel tried to do, she tried to seduce Jehu by painting her face or putting makeup on. This is Jeremiah chapter 4, and I want to read verse 30. And when thou art spoiled, what wilt thou do? Thou that clothest thyself with crimson, though thou deckest thee with ornaments of gold, though thou rentest thy face, and rentest is not a good word, but though thou rentest or destroy thy face with painting, in vain shalt thou make thyself fair, thy lovers will despise thee, they will seek thy life. So anytime you see makeup or the association of women in makeup is not from a standpoint of holiness in the Bible. Now, for those that are watching this video, keep watching the video. This has nothing to do uh, with you. I'm not condemning you at all. I'm, I'm using these scriptures to make a point that uh, Christianity did, did not plagiarize uh, from Kemet. All right. But to move further on, the women in the Bible themselves, whether they were Israelites in the Old Testament or whether they were Christians in the New Testament, the women within themselves did not wear makeup. All right. So not uh, only did the women not wear makeup, we know the men definitely didn't make it, uh, didn't wear it. I'm sorry. But men of Egypt or Kemet, both men and women wore makeup. So I want to go to Deuteronomy. Skip over here. Deuteronomy 22, 5. The woman shall not wear that which pertaineth unto the man. Neither shall a man put on a woman's garment. For all that do so are an abomination unto the Lord thy God. Now, there's another scripture in Deuteronomy that says all that doeth unrighteously are abominations to God as well. All right. 
So they were clear in the kingdom of Israel that they were distinctions between men and women, whereas though in Egypt, there are no distinctions. Both of them pretty much did the same things. So let's go with First Timothy. I'm going to read verse 9, just chapter 2. A like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly array. So, in, in contrast uh, to these women in the Bible who were apostolic versus Egyptians, um, Egyptians would wear these things. They would wear uh, jewelry and whatnot uh, to get the attention of the gods uh, per this article. I'll read some of this. All right, both men and women liked wearing lots of jewelry, and they sometimes wore fancy headdresses for special occasions. Jewelry was an important way that the Egyptians tried to get the attention of their gods. So notice, it's a com complete compare um, and contrast or polar opposites of what people in the Bible were instructed to do. They were instructed to dress in modest apparel, all right? Not to wear jewelry. It's the complete opposite. I'm going to read a little bit further. They thought that the more jewelry they wore, the more attractiveness they would be to the gods. All right, so it's polar opposite. So what God wants from believers is he, he wants the edification of the spirit. And the Bible even goes as far as to talk about the ornament of a, a meek and quiet spirit. So God is wanting the spirit. He, he's wanting the adorning um, of the spirit. He's not putting a great emphasis on on clothes and jewelry and stuff like that, but it's the polar opposite. So I'm going to start from 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may, without the word, be won by the conversation of their wives, while they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear, whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing gold or putting on apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. So I'm, I'm going to read this one. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. All right. So the Bible encourages more so the adorning of the spirit. And more puts more emphasis on the spirit of that person, the card of that person, as opposed to uh, the, the outward elements. So, I know I mentioned that uh, Egyptians, you know, they were, the men rather, were clean shaven. And, you know, they normally cut the hair on their face. Now, I need to find this. Okay. This is Leviticus chapter 19, verse 27. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. So the scriptures is telling the, the Israelite men not to uh, shave their beards, you know, but to grow their beards. Now, in the New Testament, you know, it's different. And the reason why it's different in the New Testament, because you're not dealing with uh, Israel for the most part. Like in the Old Testament, the Old Testament is about the covenant that God made with Israel. So that covenant was different as opposed to the New Testament where you're talking about the church. So the church as a whole is not bound by certain customs that Israel had or that were specifically given to Israel. But either way, it punctuates the point that this is not something that uh, the Bible plagi uh, plagiarized from Egypt. It's completely different. All right. So Genesis 35. I'm going to start at verse four. And they gave unto Jacob all the strange gods which were in their hand and all their earrings which were in their ears. And Jacob hid them under the oak which was by Shishim. So they were going to, to worship God. As the scripture said before, they made an altar and they left their strange gods. And this was before the, um, the law was given unto Israel. All right. And they took the earrings from their ears. Okay. So this is along the lines of the principles of uh, speaking of holiness. So this is once again, a polar opposite between what Egyptians did. Now, also when Egyptians would die, 
well, mainly pharaohs, they would put certain things in the, the caskets or the sarcophaguses of the Egyptian pharaohs, um, things that they thought would help them in the afterlife. So read this article, some of it. Ancient Egyptians of all walks of life mummified deceased family members, but the process was as elaborate for the poor. Okay, I'm trying to get down to this real quick. The mummies of pharaohs were placed in ornate stone coffins called sarcophaguses. They were then buried in elaborate terms filled with everything they need for the afterlife, such as vehicles, tools, food, wine, perfume, and household items. Some pharaohs were even buried with pets and servants. Right? So according to the Egyptian or Kemetic belief of the afterlife, these people took things with them and buried buried these natural things with these individuals, assuming that they could take these things with them. So I'm going to read from 1 Timothy chapter 6. I'm going to start from verse 5. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness from such withdraw thyself. So this is talking about prosperity preachers or prosperity pimps. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. So this is completely different from what Egyptians did. We as uh, believers or well, Christians know that we don't take anything from this world. Jesus himself even said that don't not to store treasures here on earth, but in heaven where moth and, and dust does, does not corrupt. So once again, we're looking at two principles between Kemet and the Bible that are polar opposites. All right. So I want to get into uh, the last thing, which is homosexuality. And this is one of the things that the lady spoke of in the video. And she basically said that, you know, this thing was, you know, it was a natural thing in Egypt. You know, people were, were homosexual and even to the point of different gods that they had that were homosexual. I'll talk about more of them in another video, but I have talked about them in Kemet videos that I've made before. All right. But homosexuality in Egypt, it was a, it was a, a cultural norm. You know, these things were acceptable, whereas though in the Bible, it makes restrictions between relations between humans. All right. So I'm going to read a little snippet about this. This is King uh, Pepe II and his general officer, Sassanet. And this is a story where uh, it's about two guys that were, you know, homosexual. All right. So the chapter in which King Pepe the second visits his loyal general officer is subject of passionate discussions, especially one certain phrase stays in the center of, investi of investigations. The text says that his majesty went into Sassanet's house and did to him what his majesty desired. All right. So this was around late night. So if you blend in late night with doing unto someone what it desired, it's clear cut that they're talking about sex. The phrase doing what one desires is a common flowery phrase to describe sex. For this reason, some scholars are convinced that the papyrus reveals King Pepe's homosexual interest in his same sex relationship to his general officers. All right, so I'm going to start right there. And this is Romans chapter 1, verse 24. I'm going to start there. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worship and serve the creature more than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up until vile affections. You know, he let them do what they wanted to do since they didn't want to obey him. For even their women did change the natural use and to that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burnt in their lust once with another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Alright, so it clearly states here in Romans, and there are other passages as well that forbid homosexuality or homosexual relationships, that this is not natural. Alright, so... Let's move, let's move forward. 